Sign up, start up on our Facebook page. Um, we're looking at doing other things like 
that, uh, which is also going to have these, that's, that's how we can kind of um, do things for you outside the kind of medicine sphere. Um, just get that kind of basic that. Yeah. And just uh, a little bit of an intro to sports medicine training. I mean, Dave's going to come and give you the full cool lowdown of it. But basically, um, you need to finish medical school. Right? I think that's uh, a big, big plan for a lot of us here. And um, after that, you need to do three years of approved training. So that's working in the hospital as an intern or as someone of a jam, but doing so on your terms. Just so, um, just like here, how you can put in your uh, preferences for uh, certain. Um, especially like orthopedics, psychology, general medicine, that kind of thing. Um, those kind of um, choices matter in those first three years. And then from there, you can sit for part one, which is basically an exercise physiology and a medicine then, right? um, with a lot of anatomy and that kind of thing. And then after that, you um, apply to be on the medical program. And then it's a four year training program, um, finishing with an ACSP uh, part two fellowship examination, and then a fellow of the Australian College of Sports. So that's pretty much it um, from us. And we'd like to pass on to Chow Yen, who is very kindly uh, agreed to come speak to us uh, about a lot of sports vision and to answer any questions you guys have. Do that in front of you. Hey, Chow. I think sometimes that's one of the reasons I 
like sport as well as what I do because in so many ways it's a similar idea. The secret is, like the medicine, there is no secret, it's basically like it. And that's what we all do. And that's what if you decide whatever you want to do, if you do the hard work, I genuinely believe you can do it. This right here, actually, so I've watched a few people do this, but this guy here is Nathan Gray. And he was a, an outstanding centre for the Waratahs and the Wallabies. He's now the coach of the Waratahs and also coach of the Wallabies. We've got another guy who's called Luke Inman, who's on the sports medicine training program. When I started, he was a centre with the Waratahs and then went all the way through and ended up doing medicine and gone on to the centre. So when you, I think the one thing when you get old, like the South, you work out that actually like the journey. And when you're young, like you guys, you come stuck in the moment. You know, what am I going to get to tomorrow? I've got to do this at And what, well, I suppose now I look back and it's the a journey rather than the moment. And so in sports medicine, I've seen like this journey of like these young athletes who are now like parents that, you know, going into coaching or in different areas of business. So no longer, you know, at least sports So, like most things in life, again, like the sports and the thing I always do tell an athlete is it's really important to have some form of that. It's really important to have yourself in the middle and then there are all these other components and when it comes to training, the really important things obviously are sleep, exercise and the diet as well. So it's really important for them to get their battery on board, to get you know, other friends on board and spend time with them. My journey, um, a lot of it's been opportunity, but a lot of it's been perhaps deciding what I want to do and then just going in the direction. So, as I said, when I started, there was no specialist in sports medicine. In fact, to, the truth be known, I actually wanted to be an IT surgeon. And I kind of started on that road and it became, you know, it was quite difficult. Um, and for me, I was, I, you know, enjoyed life as well and I sort of started sort of go in the direction of orthopedics and it just didn't turn out that you didn't need that I wanted to for me so I found the new direction. But prior to doing that, I'd always want to do orthopedic surgery that was one thing for me. So I went over to England and I did what was called a diploma of sports medicine over there, which was in London, which was a full time in the US at the University College in London. But through that time I worked in sport, I was involved in <coughs> Formula One car racing, I did a fire race back around the London Marathon and a number of other events. You get a lot of opportunity if you choose to go in that direction. Um, and I achieved the time as well. I then actually came to Australia and went back to New Zealand. So in New Zealand, at that time, I was actually doing what I did. But um, I still had the thinking that I wanted to do the sports medicine. So I started getting involved in the sports medicine back then in the that was. So I did, again, multiple. So rugby league, rugby union, I ended up getting a role with the New Zealand women's rugby union team. I actually got a month I did with the All Blacks, but they were bringing me back to women. So it wasn't quite, <laughs> a, quite <laughs> a, such a big thing, but in the end it actually worked out being a lot of fun. Um, netball, I look after karate, triathlon, cricket, hockey, you name it, I put my hand up for any sport at any time. And each of those things have different opportunities. Again, I the Rockland car rally in New Zealand, which virtually went from one end of New Zealand to the other. And uh, did that. So then I came to Australia. So did my part one, so you saw that in Australian college. Did my part one in New Zealand, so then applied to the same thing over here, and then got a job over here, having uh, got my part one over there. So then in, in Australia, during my, during my training time, you do many, many, many different types of sports that you can. And I did many, many different types of sports. Um, during the Olympics, I did a research project on um, bone stress, which was amazing. I was at the Rugby World Cup um, out at New South Wales Institute. I think David's driving from now. A lot of screening with different athletes diving. Um, I went on a TV show called Team of the Toughest, which was basically we took quietly around Australia to Ayers Rock and all these different places in Tasmania, and they had to do crazy challenges and I was like pretty much the doctor hiking the doctor and having the help back and I really was nervous that something would happen that I'd be way out of my depth but it didn't. 
Um, and eventually, I got myself to um, about that time, I kind of sort of um, solidified my journey in rugby union. But I've done a lot of rugby union back in New Zealand. Again, most of it's volunteer work. So there's a guy who captured the all that was called Carnival Miner. And uh, I was, he always called the kids that I was the first doctor. Like, we could transfer from rugby league to rugby union. I was looking out for the club. And, you know, so that's the journey you watch. And so then came across here and I looked at the board and I said, so that was at the club level. And then we found the new ones. My big message on this this slide is really the volunteer. Like in this day and age, we do hear that you know young people want to be they want to be the Warrior doctor. But in fact, they forget that all injuries are the same. Like all people are the same. Like we push them all the same, and we look after them. It's much enthusiasm for the club player as you do for the their, their best player, their staff player. You find those people. Sometimes it comes up on some day and now we look up. So it's really important that you actually do think about you know, volunteering, putting your hand up, and you're not always expecting to be paid. Um, because that's kind of when people sort of fall out of the system, then there's always always this expectation um, you know, that they need to be paid or they want to volunteer, and then a lot of them don't have to do it. So I have a lot of mottos in my life, but this to me is, is a really important motto that I have about praising people you um, I think you all need to have clarity of vision for where, you, where you're going. I think you always have to have a healthy vision for your present. Never get comfortable where you are. I think you have to have high standards of excellence, and we all do, being the best that you do. Have a sense of urgency. You always have that feeling like you've got, you've got, you've got to keep moving. Um, have a strong commitment to implement and, and just have you need that ability to eliminate the distraction and to go in that direction and come. So I thought I could talk to you all day. So I, I mean, it's been 16 years of actual rugby, I've seen a lot of stuff. Um, so I thought I'd, I'd talk to you about one thing I've seen over the years of leadership. I've seen a lot of leadership since I feel like I've seen many of my kids. I think about seven coaches. And I think about 18 assistant coaches and a lot of videos. So they all have messages and they all teach you things, and that's why it's really exciting to be in sports medicine because you actually see something very different from the school medicine or from basketball medicine. You actually see this world that most of us have not any opportunity to see. So I sort of picked out some of the main coaches and some of the main people that have been involved in my time with the Warrior and I'll tell you. A little bit about what I saw in their leadership actually brought to the team because they were all very successful in their own life at certain times. So, you and Mackenzie have all heard of that thing I call it this, the Hawthorne effect, which I don't know if you know, the Hawthorne effect is a study which was done in a, in, a, um, in a factory where they told them, they told the workers first that if they, they were doing this study on whether insect lighting would increase their productivity. And what they ended up finding was that, in fact, once they told the people that they were going to increase the lighting in their workplace, that they actually, that their productivity increased prior to the lighting that they turned up. So the, the message is really that sometimes it's not so much about what you do, it's about actually having a plan and everyone getting on board for the plan. So the white side came to the from the parents for a very long time. And so you and McKenzie announced the team that we've got this plan and said, like, we all hate going to plan. Like, we all hate going to <laughs> <laughs> And he said, so we always go there as late as possible and we get out as quickly as we can. We hate going there, we hate the food, we hate going to the food, we hate going to the ship that way. We really don't like going to camera, and every team that goes to camera has the same experience. With you. So, what he said is, We are going to, we're not going on the plane, we are going to drive the bus, the Waratah bus, with the little Waratah stuff on. We're going to drive it to camera on Tuesday, and we're going to drive our bus around camera, and we're going to let everyone in camera know that the Waratah are in camera for the week. We're going to sit in their cafes, and we're going to drink their shit that night, and we're going to beat these guys. 
probably some of the blame is a little bit more prior than that. <laughs> but anyway, that's what happened. Everyone's on board and we beat them. We beat them for the first time and the whole one, the whole lot of people. And that's what the whole thing is. And I think you might have heard about the Socceroos one time, I think they were coming back from South America and they did this thing where they basically they tried to fly them at a lower altitude, they had massage surface and they were playing the hill and they were really fantastic. And that's the come back to Australia and win this game. And again, that's the same concept. There's no proof that having massage on the plane is going to make them win a game. But the fact that the team believes that this is what we're doing to do this, to have this victory, to make a difference. And having gone through a season where we've actually won the competition, but we finally fought as if we are winners. I actually find that probably the psychological component of the most important part of the most important part of the Another coach that I worked with. Um, with this guy called Bob Wong, who actually won the World Cup in 1991, and this one took a lot of groups of kids, and this one I got a lot of groups of kids, and this one I got a lot of groups of kids, and this one I got a lot of groups of kids, and this one I got a lot of groups of kids, and this one I got a lot of groups of kids, and this one I got a lot of groups of kids, and this one I got a lot of groups of kids, and this one I got a lot of groups of kids, and he goes, stand up and he goes, I'm really, really worried. I'm really, really worried that we don't that we don't have the ability to give everything of ourselves. To give to be on that field and know you have nothing more to give, that you have done your absolute and there is nothing wants to. I don't know if we've got that. Anyway, it's quite funny because at the football stadium, and they have these tours at the football stadium, and all these tourists come in every now and then, and they let, allow them to come down the hallway and enter the ground as if they're playing a game of football. So, what happens is at the same time they do that, they all of a sudden slip on this music with the Australian anthem. <laughs> So Bob's giving a speech and then all of a sudden the, the Australian anthem starts to loud and everyone's just sitting there. They're just completely taken back. Don't be afraid of that part out of that one. He's like, this is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> like they're all just like so pumped. And you know, whether it's related or not, but we won the game. But again, it's an example, that's how he used to coach. Like it was all about the, you know, making how much you can teach. How much more can you do? And there were times when you would have, like Nathan going on the field, where you would literally be dragged off if you still wanted to be out there in the game. In 2006, so this one's just a few months, like I think you know, might make some incredible difference to. There's a guy called Sean Burke, he's a man with fire, he plays for five eight and six and five eight, and he and another guy called Bob Terry, which I'll come up with the one in the body contact with Sean who's been at the time with his uh his team magazine is looking for a bachelor to do a shoot. And single at the time. And they said if it's on Wednesday, it's on the day off, and we'll just do it. They don't want to do it in the change to the stadium. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
and we're going to pull you out for long. We're going to throw him and uh, we're going to watch the video. And then, uh, and like all of a sudden, the music stopped. And it was that song on uh, YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> and all of a sudden, there was this photo to show him all these poses. And then it completes it up. With this teddy bear and the farmer's hat, and you know, but like mainly, mainly topless like this. And literally, everyone was falling off their chair. And like, I haven't heard them so noisy and laughing so much in the whole time. And they felt so good, like we've gone into this game, I'm concerned about it. They felt so good, they changed superbly. And so, you know, and that's not the only thing I can tell you um, but, you know, it's not often that as a daughter doctor, you kind of get exposed to that stuff, unless you're not just a daughter doctor in the legal group itself, but for most of us that aren't, it's things like this. was probably the most, he was the most, uh, captain for the longest while I've been there. Um, a lot of people have seen him on the field, I call this the king. He is the uh, once more to bring it. Like, he is the man that basically was, you know, followed by example, once more to the bridge here and once more, more to take the fight. Like, basically, he would say, You guys, I'm going in that direction, come on in. And, you know, he's a very successful captain. Um, he would yell at the players, but the one thing he would do is, he would always. But you and Kenzie used to talk about a bank performance, like an 8 out of 10. Like every time I put that thing on the field, I'm going to be an 8 out of 10. If you put Kirby Bill on the field, it might be a 10 out of 10, but then you might have a lot of 5. You know what I mean? And so then when the coach is looking at the team, they can kind of work out what you're getting. So this bloke's always 8 out of 10. And so then when he could be a really good captain, he would be a 5 out of 10. I think Michael Bill is exactly the same. Same move by the and so they never ask you never ask anything on the team that you're not getting the count. And then the last one is our current coach, and I call him the man of the people. I don't know if you can talk to him, probably understand that. But if anyone knows anything about golf, Arnold Palmer was always called the man of the people. He was the man that took what was called the gentleman's game to the common man. And, uh, and what my particular, he does a lot of things. Um, and he has a lot of very good stories, and he's an incredibly inspirational man. But the example I'll use here is we, uh, at, at Waratah, there's like a downstairs, and then there's an upstairs, and the downstairs is where all the players and everyone are, and the upstairs is where all the marketing and management and all that sort of thing are. And there's, there's always a bit of a divide, you know, and sort of like the players are like uh, management and come like, downstairs. And, Place was obviously, but it was sort of like, not that it was all good, but it comes to the down to And each year, different CEO, different coach, they have the strategy to try and mix the upfield and the downfield, you know, like, what are the positions, and what are the positions that have to come down to the downfield, or, you know, some male would have to go up and, you know, say good day to them. Whatever, but anyway, when Michael Tickler started, we walked in there the second day of the year. He said, um, First of all, we walked into a room like this, and it's like this, and we are like, and he's the one who did it, and he was set up. And then I was like, I've got a branch here, um, I just want to write a circle. So a circle, and then it sits in the middle, and then it's like, 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 and um, so you'll notice as you walk around the building, I've put photos and I've put names on everyone. Upstairs and downstairs with names here. And so you know if you go into the physios, the characteristics, the characteristics, the characteristics. And he said, so what I want you to do is he said, it's kind of good to see the three people in the home. You should do that. And then we'll walk past the door and say, like, it's my workplace. And he said, so what I want you to do is when you come to work in the morning, Come in, he's got the bags in the locker, and he goes straight upstairs. And he said, You see all their names there? I want you to say hello to two people. Walk up to them, 
John, how are you today? Good we'll things. And all of a sudden, like that, Gary was like, so all of a sudden he had, you know, people, the little bloke who's working for country lady in the corner, is he allowed to come out and say, oh, um, hi, Gary. He's really awkward, he's really awkward, but, you know, all of a sudden, it misses, and, you know, that's, that's what this thing does. Like, he just has this ability to do all the right things. So I talked about a journey before, so I picked that again, it's a character I know very well because he was a captain for a long time while I was there. And I'll tell you what um, his career has meant. So and not not many people have a successful career and and this life. And that's probably part of the story. If you get to if you're involved in sport, you can some like this and you'll see some like that. So he played professional rugby for 11 years. He was the second player to change that. But Ben Robinson is now a master for a um, He was a captain for 58 and 35 days. He was only six years old. Wallaby 79 times. He was a captain and won the John Lewis medal. And he won the Matt Bates Cup. He's not everyone's daughter. He's not everyone's story. So in my 16 years, I have seen a lot of things. I've seen the retirement of people that have probably now they me in the team. Uh, the significant osteoarthritis of the knee, two of the anchors guy here landed from the line out and he's never played that reason. Other than the reason that he's never recovered. The guy that developed osteoarthritis, I can see that got a type 1 diabetic that's playing for money. It's a big storm in the health of this guy got osteoarthritis during the trial period. There's no doubt that this guy got to so you get that little bit of medicine as well. I've got multiple people who I've met and they have never had that. So, you know, start of the season, November, they all rock up. Oh, I've got this piece of the One year later, they're gone. And the thing is, sometimes it takes away, you know, while you're doing medicine, they can't be giving all that up to go and play professional sport, and then they don't know. It. You know, so it's. There's sort of a lot of sadness as well, which is why I get so passionate when I hear some of the stuff that the public says about these players. But there's so few of them that actually make it to the top. I mean, the ones that make it to the top, you know, they so far to be here. There's so much about time. Sometimes they get an injury, and then it's just before the time, and then they never get seen. So, um, so uh, and one boy had a, yeah, he had a little patient at the age of. So this is Phil's career, so that's the first three years, 2000, 2001, this is the sort of pathology that we see. So he knocked his tooth out very early in the first round and he's now had a bridge in the past. Uh, Subluxed the sh shoulder and he fought with soft <coughs> nerve damage, teletinopathy, uh, subluxed and perineal tendons that year, had an operation in about four months. Now that on the other side, he had significant ankle ligament damage and everything. Now this is the bloke that put him on the field. One week after we left the PCR, posted a picture that he was me. So we're talking a fairly tough character here. Had a list rank injury to the foot, which is a, a heel, um, who's out for three weeks, subluxed his elbow, uh, and that's still a problem. And a blue spot, which is actually a lot of people. Truth was still giving problems in this three years. He did a sternoclavicular joint. He had a torn cartilage just as he was going with the wallabies that year to have an arthroscopy. Again, he subluxed another shoulder and he had nerve damage for three weeks in a very That's probably one of the years. As they get older, more injuries. Another three years. So we've got a couple of concussions, got a fractured rib, missed, never missed any time with the fracture. So he had rib cartilage and fractured rib injuries and he had always had time. Um, fractured patella, that was operated on, perineal tendon, another operation, another ankle, a couple of hamstrings, and AC joint, which was operated on. 
and then the last thing is again another living ring. I think we'll um we can do that in the living room. There's the ring put that there again, pay it finally. Um the calf's vein for about three weeks is back to the toe, then the game. He ruptured his distal biceps tendon, it was in his final year of his contract. No, it's normally you hear though. Um he we got enough evidence of people that have had a matter of hair now and supposed to be final year of the muscle surgery so it's okay to look at that. Um he's now got back to top line performance and stuff. We actually met a lot in what's been a lot of that this thing to be which is probably called ongoing problems with cross pain and then significant hamstring problems with that because of the move. So that is uh Big highs 
Like in order to stay with that team that had so many coaches and so many physios in that, I've had to learn to be a lot more collaborative. And I think that I really like that about what, what I've learned on my journey. I've really enjoyed that side of it. It's given me a bit of a world. And, you know, I have one of those times where I think, make a brain in 30 days. Anyway, he said, you keep you young. You know, you're involved in like a, a healthy cycling path for your legs. So general common power makes a statement which I think is really important. <coughs> See people who have some balance in their lives who are fun to hang around with, who like to laugh at themselves too, and who have some non-job priorities which they approach with the same passion that they do that they do their work. Spare me the grim workaholic or the pompous potential professional. I help me find jobs with my career. I leave them this is my mission. Five minutes. Be fast, flexible, focused, friendly, and fun. This is what I do most days of the week. These are the people I sometimes get the opportunity to meet. This is a uh, village up in uh, South Africa. This is training. That's the life I lead. And finally, that was the conclusion last year. That's my kind of work for down the time. So it's exciting. You know, if you're vaguely interested in sports medicine, get involved, volunteer, meet mm -hmm. people, choose to sit in, do all of those things. It's a good life. Uh, yeah, I do. <laughs> <laughs> you see, you saw it. Alright, guys, so now what we're going to do is we're going to have Dr. Fahad uh, run through a foot and ankle plus the examination and some skills for you to learn from. Um, this will be really useful and interesting because um, it's not formally done in our medical curriculum program, so I think this will be quite interesting to see. Um, so, yeah, you, I think this is going to be a good day. So, so what, what we will do here is I'll just, um, I suppose what happens is when you see a joint or a, 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 a patient comes in and they have a take and you refine your thinking as you're taking it. So what I will try to do here is give you almost like a complete, it will jump out a little bit, but a complete examination and tell you what I would be looking for at the time and why I would look in that area. Um, so it's not, I don't know why to do all my things. So it's a bit like if I think it's an article in the structure, I'm not going to do it. It's not so you do define it. So we, we look, uh, we feel, we move, and, and then we do, we do this sort of specialised text for all the different areas. So I'll sort of run through how I go about it. Could be a bit jumpy because I don't have a defined injury scope. But, you know, she's actually done this really cool, so just, just do it for my um, Yeah, so I'm going really to done this. So, so what we'll do is um, we always get um, our patients to take their shoes and socks off and clothes off with hands. We in consulting and we'll always have shorts so that um, you know you get, most people can get them down so you can actually see the leg. Look at the alignment, and you'll start with those as basics when you lie on the injury. So, I'll just start and I'll talk through as we go. So, the first thing I just want you to do is just turn the stand in front of me. No, 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 stand in front of And what I'll tend to do here is I'll just look at both the feet and ankles, and again, I'm looking for swelling, and you'll do this in everything you do, but swelling or deformity, and I'll get an immediate impression as to whether. You know, she rolls in a little bit or if she's got, you know, flat feet and I'm taking that on board to think about about the injury. And then uh, what I'll get you to do now for me, Kristen, is I'll get you to stand on one leg. And we'll, maybe we'll, we'll concentrate on the right leg here. And can I get you to just bend down at the knee for me? And so what I'm looking at here is a number of things, but from, from this position here, I'm looking, you can see come up actually with the part here. Um, so I'm looking for rolling in. So what will happen is often when you get them to stand on one leg, they'll tend to roll, roll in on their foot. 
And uh, so that's when you start thinking, I might be referring this person to the dietist and then prescriptive orthotics. And then uh, I'll get you to turn around for me, Kristen. And stand, can you stand on that foot again? And I'll, I would normally do both sides, but we'll just do one foot. And again, bend down at the knee. Now, what I'm looking for here is not information about the foot so much, but I'm looking more at the knee. And we have she's got it short, but normally I'd come up here. So what I'm looking for, let me get up. Um, so I'm looking for control around her glutes. So this is like my single bit leg control test. Control of the glutes and not going into valves here. Okay. So what you tend to find, because if they've got even if they've got overuse injuries in their foot and ankle, they'll tend to have poor control here. So you get them to stand on one leg and they'll tend to drop in like this, or they drop in at the, the knee. And so if they've got that sort of single leg control when they're out on a netball court or something, and then they go to land, if they lose it at the knee, then they're going to increase their risk of a cruciate rupture or something like that. I'll just get you to stand, come up onto your toes for me, Kristen. And again, the same thing, I'm looking for formation of the arch of the foot here and the fact that she can go up onto your toes. And if we say we're going with the right one, now, we'll get to stay there and i just get you to go up and down on your right leg for me five times. Now, if she's got a ruptured tibialis posterior or an Achilles, she wouldn't even be able to do it. But if she had a ruptured tip pose, they won't be able to do five single leg heel raises, and that's the classic test for it. And then, uh, same with Nakis, and they probably won't be able to do any, it will be too painful. But again, that's a good test for your Nakis tendon in that respect. Two legs they'll be able to do. So, for whatever reason, you can kind of take a lot through the other leg. So, you need to get them on one, on one leg. Now, I'd also, just for brevity, I'll get them to walk. And I'll watch walking and often sometimes get them to run. So I take them out into my corridor and get them to walk or run. And again, observing, you might pick up a limb or you'll pick up that rolling in or you just pick up a gate here. Um, so, let's just put you up here. And I personally examine them with their feet, maybe you can just sit down a little bit here. So the first thing I do when I'm at the end of the bed is I always try and check the leg length discrepancy. So when I take the medial malleolo, I just put the thumbs together and just bring them together like that and she doesn't put that. Now what I would do, say if it was like this one sitting up a little bit, or this one sitting up a little bit, it may be coming from the pelvis. So what you can do is get them to bend the knees, the back down again, and then straighten them. And now, Christine, can you just point your toes down for me? So I'm looking at range here and fill up. And then the ankle range looks pretty nice. And you can hear them here. I can also can hear them in standing, so I can get into a squat in standing or measure again at the wall that this one. So often, if like someone's going back to running, I'll get them to do a knee to wall here, see how far they can bring this now to keep the heel on the ground. And what I find, I say to them, you know, they need to have six to eight centimetres before they can run. So if they have to come back from an ankle sprain, and like this one's like at 12, and this one's like at three, and they're running and they're saying, I'm getting pain, then it's pretty easy for me to say, you know, you need to work on that range before you can run. If you run, it's three centimetres, you just don't have enough range to run. And it's possibly so just looking at the different tendons that down the road, so the perineal tendons down the side here, we test those, let's push out to the other side, that's it, so I'm not any pain or dust, any pain. And again, you're observing down here, see the tendon, um, you look for sort of swelling and curl, that sort of thing, and then you can do, and then to the other side area, inversion, we don't know what that is. Like. <laughs> Come up towards you, like so, and push them down. And then we'll just go into palpation. So again, we'll do, you know, how much have you done on your anatomy? Anatomy, I think one of the most important things is if you want to do sports medicine, you want to know your anatomy. And the reason you want to know your anatomy is every time you get a finger in someone's 
tags and you put them on an area of the anatomy. So it's that defined. And sometimes you see people, you know, you see other doctors, and every experience you get with any doctor, don't ever be bored by it because if you don't agree with what they're doing, then learn the lesson that you're not going to do what they do. And that will make life a little bit more interesting for you. Because you will meet doctors who you don't actually like the way they practice. And so from that, take a lesson out of that is how I would do it. But sometimes you find out to a lot of um, it's touching and touching broadly rather than with method or, or, or reason. So when you come around the foot, you want to actually, each time you put it, come on. So there's your calcaneo could be a little bit right there. And then you come straight on to the anterior tailor could be a little bit. And then you just pack it back to the little spine. Up on to the there's nice with there. That's the anterior, inferior ligament there. And you can actually go up between the two there and then there's a posterior there. You come around the back, then across the ankle joint, and through here. Again, you can look for sort of bottom fullness there, and we can actually think that in the fusion in the ankle, you can kind of go off the top side and sort of feel that through there. So through the ankle joint. And if they ever go that sore, the other thing will break them if you've got another one to go on. So often the medial talent bone, which is right there, it can be quite tender. So again, if they off, they'll go, oh, that's quite sore. And then they go, oh, how's it feel there? Oh, yeah, that's quite sore. And then to them, the other thing is very easy. Come down and then look at them. And then around, downward movement here. So you come fibular as well for a fracture through there. And then you'll know that it's here. And then you've got the delta the moment, and then you have the delta not too much. But it is. So coming into the foot, again, um, we talked about a list prank injury on someone, uh, Phil Ward had one. And again, that's more into the serious area, so you always have a feel. If someone comes in and says they've had an ankle injury, there's a few important things that you need to tell okay, Kate. One of them is the base of the foot and the parking. And whenever you order an extra match on the lats, and they take, they, they show the hook through the cartoon, so that's there. And the other is the anterior process of the cartoon. Yeah. Um, so again, I'll take that area because they'll look like a standard ankle sprain, but if you make that diagnosis, they're going to treat it very differently than just a standard ankle sprain. Um, so then we can get you to, so let's go around the back. Um, so around the back, I don't know if you've heard that uh, you can diagnose a um, fractured Achilles tendon. Yes, 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 yes. So and this one you can, if someone thinks they've done it, you can talk to them over the phone and just say, put your knee on a chair and squeeze your calf, and your foot will go down. So basically, it's a what symptoms have. That's what happens. If they've got a ruptured Achilles tendon, this sits like this. It tends to just, that one will be like that, and this one will sit like that. And then when you squeeze the calf, this one will move because there's no connection here. Flexor house is long. This is the other one which you can literally just put pressure on the side. Put pressure on the Achilles tendon. Can you see the big toe down? Well, that's how you know you've got an intact flexor house is long. <laughs> Um, there's a thing called posterior impingement, so we have a test called posterior impingement test, and that is where we literally take the back of the heel and kind of compress it here, and so that causes impingement and pain in the back there. Ballerinas get that because they have, they often can have what's called an oscodonum. Like 6 to 11 percent of the normal population have what's called an oscodonum, and that's like a little bone that sits in here, and because a ballet dancer or a kicker, because they spend so much time on point like this, they end up aggravating this around here. So if they lay down to come, the old days, well, there's a lot of these things that we can diagnose that while but people have got Arkham's tendonitis. And they do go around the back and they go, like this, and they go, oh, that's my pain. And that's because that's where they've got the problem. And sometimes it can be a ganglion or Sometimes it can be after an ankle strain and they've had all this inflammation and there's a whole lot that's still left in there. Okay. That's only showing that from there. Um, 
This when you're looking for like people that have the current ankle strains and you're looking for, you know, so I like to keep rolling my ankle like every few weeks. I go over my ankle. We want to test the stability of the ankle. There's a couple of things uh, that we do. And one is, um, <clears throat> this is called the Taylor Tilt, and it's in basically we do that. So you're testing mainly the calcaneal fibula ligament. And again, you say that comes to the end. This is quite loose. And then you can compare it with the other side here, which is a little bit deeper. So you're getting a range similar. And then the anterior tailor for the other, which is the other up here, is going to be the other like this. And then what I tend to do is put this thing in this under the tip of the fibula. And then this is the best way to do it. And in saying that, it can be as loose as a boost, and if they're not having a problem, you're not really going to anything about it. You're not saying that you're not going to be able to scrap it up. But um, you, know, you treat the patient's symptoms not always the clinical presentation, and some people are quite mobile as well, so they have any bit of a molecular, you want to get a molecular perspective. It's uh, quite a com common must not miss. And again, it's called the end spot in the special life. So you're enjoying that end spot. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> anyone, even in rugby, we've seen it a few times. So it's in the studio, and that's one of the ones who don't want to miss it because they've seen it. Have I missed anything, David? No, um, no, it's all there. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, if you wanted to uh, go into single diagnosis tests, we've got the test that are a bit rarer yeah. um, for, for uh, a high ankle sprain. <coughs> so those are the ones that uh, I think some of the physios and GPs are more common in this, but sports physicians are often in the Yeah, exactly. Well, we went through the tenderness, and then for a single diagnosis, then you I'll get them to do a forward squat. Like so, so say there's a couple of ways of doing that. But like one of the just do a squat for me, just like that, and then they'll say, Oh, that's quite sore at the front, and then what you can do in that situation is you compress because the syndesmosis keeps the tibia and the fibula together, and the talus is wider at the front and it is at the back. So when you go into a forward squat, why does the struggle to come back running now? Is that when they <coughs> do that squat? The wider trailer causes the bones to sort of be pushed apart. So, what you can do is you get a little bit of compression here, and then when they squat forward, they say, Oh, that feels a little bit better. Or <clears throat> the other one is on the people that are down the supine. And then we rotate the other And then the other I use come back the same. We don't use it's here. And I can move it the same. Like so I feel the movement of the talus between the fibula and the tibia. And then I've got a control position. And if it's still moving in that position, you can float it around. Yeah, if it's still moving in this position, then I'm concerned. Um, in, in textbooks, they talk about the um, squeeze test where you squeeze the um, the tibia and the fibula, uh, fibula sorry, together, and like approximately uh, the head to the sleeve, um, it's a serious injury. Yeah. Um, is that an effective test? I know, I know it's yeah, it is. Well, and the other thing is to never forget the maze and nerve fracture, mm -hmm. which is the high fibula, and then they have disruption on the downward. So, in that situation, you'll be turning it up the top. But yeah, that squeeze test again, the same thing if they have a good traveling pain will help. <laughs> All right, and does anyone have any questions about the foot and ankle again? Okay, so it's been a pretty long day, so we, we, were, um, we were planning on having everybody kind of do it as well, but um, obviously that's going to take ages and so many people here. But David is here from the ACSP, who's um, 
came in and gave us a chat about what it's like to be on the program. Well, uh, is that something we're keen to, to listen to, or you guys? Yeah, I've, I've, we got some frequently asked questions in email format that I wanted to address. Is, uh, I think it, you know, just for those of you who are members, obviously had the time to think about the decisions, and you've obviously just run away everything up. So I can spend the next five minutes just going through that briefly. People are happy to hear it. Um, and then I think we'll say, I had some interesting cases to go through, but with, uh, we can say to leave something like that to leave for next time. And, uh, and maybe guys can practice the ankle examination and uh, that as well if you like. Is that all right? Yeah. Let's, let's give the presentation up. Thanks, Thanks so much, Sharon. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
intellectual contribution to it. And, uh, so, um, there are some lifestyle issues, even as a registrar with sports medicine, but um, playing it up to there are many other steps in your life, including doing policy, and, uh, <laughs> and it, it comes up once in a matter of stuff. Um, I'll just show you my age as I went through it. And, and this is going to end here. Um, I, the, so I got my medical degree at 26, that's what I was going to do, which probably you can reflect on and think about how that changes your biological age. Um, and I had to keep it 28, uh, but I passed the part one exam at 27, thank you. So, so that's an issue too. I think it's a prioritised. Um, take that into account. I, would, I don't know what that time after I did this. Really good to uh, stay with my life. And then, um, hopefully, I'll be there to stay by the time I'm in LA. I'll be there to stay by the time I'm in LA. I'll be there to stay by the time I'm in LA. I'll be there to stay by the time I'm in LA. I'll be there to stay by the time I'm in LA. I'll be there to stay by the time I'm in LA. I'll be there to stay by the time I'm in LA. I'll be there to stay by the time I'm in LA. I'll be there to stay by the time I'm in LA. I'll be there to stay by the time I'm in LA.
compared to our other abundance of nodes and an abundance of ability to further the as well. So it's got a really excellent price to know and still um obviously there will be the major differences as well. You can do anything that's bigger than this given as a company So you can describe the definition of the pie. And you can also diagnose um non-muscular specific and in fact some of the the best types of things that you'll come across are masculine So an example of that was uh, last week I had one of the uh, New South Wales Academy clients who dislocated his shoulder for the third time and we did an MRI and I was talking to the radiologist at the time about the MRI and he sort of commented and said, oh, he's got like a little bit more red marrow than I would expect for an 18 year old and so I did a full blood count and he had a chronic myeloid disease and he was diagnosed with dislocated his shoulder. It's the medical side of it crops up all the time. It's bread and butter, and then there's the stuff on the side. So you're expected to supplement this with the food. Once more, the chemical supplement. I'm sure that access to me has a position statement out there, and I encourage you to go there and have a look on the website for the position statement on supplement. But in my own, um, I guess my own view of my opinion of supplements, it varies from the script. So if you look at the public market last week, we have to say that it's a supplement. Because, because a lot of the um, value and attraction to the script is the entertainment value, obviously, value of color, having the biggest, toughest, muscular, muscular people going on and creating the other things here. Um, but then I wouldn't be a doctor for any smoke or after that. So that would be the same thing as a doctor has a panel. But look, at least what I've explained in the sense, if you look at it, um, step back and you look at the court and the community court, then um, supplements, if the supplement is performing from anything without offering a necessary therapy, then potentially an unfair substance, you know,
It wasn't long after that that I got asked to do that for a while. And then you see the band that you might not think of, you know, if you go through the end, but methods, certain methods of band, I thought that this one is a sustained release carbohydrate, and you've got to take it. Thank you very much. Thanks, guys. <laughs>